In this video, I explain what LHEB traces are and their role in reinforcement learning. If you never heard about LHEB traces, you will discover that they are a powerful and efficient mechanism for credit assignment that combine the best from both temporal difference and Monte Carlo methods. But here is the true gem of LHEB traces. They keep a trace, a short-term memory of all the states visited in the near past and update the value of these already seen states only when a positive or negative event occurs. This is totally different, almost opposite of how the usual temporal difference Monte Carlo and multi-step updates operate that ground their turn on future states. And this changing view opens the door to major efficiencies and advantages. Indeed, with this new mechanism, LGB traces can do Monte Carlo style updates, also in non-episodic environments, and can substantially improve the learning speed in environments with delayed or sparse rewards by speeding up the credit assignment process. But despite all of these nice features that come along with LGB traces, they are rarely used in deep reinforcement learning. And the reason lies behind the gradient of deep learning architecture. But we'll get to all of this later. So stick around till the end of the video. I'm Andrea and this is Bits of Deep Learning. If you are learning something new and enjoying the video, don't hesitate to share it with your friends and colleagues and subscribe to the channel. Great, thanks. Let's go back to our LHBT traces, or even better, let's first review the role of temporal difference and Monte Carlo updates. A solid background is better to understand the power of LHBT traces. Let's say you are at a state S. And you, you want to estimate its value or similarly its state action value so that later you can use it to perform control and choose the best action. Monte Carlo update is the most simple one as you just have to roll out an entire trajectory until the episode ends. Compute the sum of the discounted or undiscounted returns and update the original state value in the direction of the new value. This type of update has two major drawbacks. The first is that you have to wait until the end of the episode to compute the update. Thus, in a more general non-episodic environment that doesn't have an end, you cannot apply this rule. The second drawback is related to its high variance. The longer the sequence of transitions, the higher will be the number of possible trajectories all with different return values, always assuming a certain degree of stochasticity in the policy and or environment. Thus, by just unfolding one of the possible trajectories, you will have an estimate with high variance. Thankfully, the temporal difference update is here to help us. In fact, it uses a bootstrap state value on the immediate next stage. Thus, with Temporal difference, you just need to do one step before updating its value. This eliminates both the problem of the high variance and that of waiting until the end of the episode. As always, there is a but. In this case, the but is that TD has a high bias. The high bias is due to the fact that the value used to bootstrap is an approximation of the true value that is a biased estimate. Also, temporal difference suffers from a slow credit assignment. At each iteration, the reward is propagated only by one step. So for the second to last state to be credited for its value, a new sampling has to be made. For the third to last, three iterations are needed. And so on. these slow the learning process. Nonetheless, the temporal difference returns are generally preferred above Monte Carlo. And a simple strategy to reduce the high bias of temporal difference 
though at the expense of a higher variance, is to wait n steps before using the bootstrap value. Thus, for example, in the case of n equals 2, the update will be the sum of the two rewards, discounted or undiscounted, plus the value estimate at the second stage. This is called n step update, a very frequent method to combine both strategies. So which n should we use? Well, it depends on the algorithm and on the environment. But by picking an n, we are still removing the benefit of the other n steps. Why not using multiple n steps? For example, we could average the update for a two step and a four step update. By using the same reasoning, we could interpolate between all these steps. We can do that as long as the sum remains 1. This is the reasoning behind the lambda return. The most common strategy to average the returns is to use a geometric weighting of the n steps returns according to a lambda factor. Using this strategy, the weighting of the future steps will decay accordingly to the lambda decay value. The resulting lambda term will be the sum over all the n steps weighted by the lambda. The weighting factor is a similar mechanism to the discount factor gamma, in that both are used to give more weight to the immediate future compared to the distant one, but they play a different role. Lambda is only for averaging the n returns. It does not change the return value as done by gamma. Also note that lambda has always to sum up to 1 to obtain a valid update. You can easily see that the lambda return is a generalization of temporal difference and Monte Carlo updates. Indeed, you can obtain temporal difference return by setting lambda to 0 and Monte Carlo return by setting lambda to 1. Thus, varying the lambda value, you can produce a family of updates that span a spectrum from Monte Carlo to the temporal difference methods. This algorithm is called offline lambda return. If you are rambling, looking at the expensive computation, you don't need to worry. There is a recursive version of it that brings the cost down from O n squared to O n. Great, but wait. So far we removed the problem of the high variance of the Monte Carlo update and increased the credits assignment speed, but we are still constrained to having the full trajectory. To compute the offline lambda return, we have to wait until the end of the episode. To remove this constraint, we need to take a step further. As I said, this is the offline lambda return that updates the value estimate by looking at the returns of the next steps. So until it sees all the rewards it might get on the future steps, it cannot update the current state it is sitting in. Without using a bootstrap value, it cannot figure out what might get next. So what's the solution? By looking behind you. I'm not kidding. See, the current algorithms from temporal difference to lambda returns are based on what we call forward view. As explained by this nice picture from the book of Sutton and Barto, that is the state value of ST is updated by looking out at what will come next. So at the rewards R T plus one, the next state, the reward R T plus two, and so on until the last date. Luckily, we have an unpopular but very powerful backward view. In a backward view, we will update the states already visited based on what we have seen until now. Very simple idea, but how can we implement it? By using the eligibility traces. The eligibility trace in this figure is contained in the vector zt. You can look at the eligibility trace as a short-term memory, a trace that stores the states you visited so far, with a weighting mechanism that makes the old state decay over time. So the trace indicates at every point in time 
the states eligible to update whenever a reinforcing event occurs. Thus, when the reinforcing event occurs, the value of the states with a trace value different from zero will be updating following the rates and the reinforce error just recorded. For example, if this is the MDP and the current trajectory is this one, then the trace will contain all these states visited, weighted by their age, the lambda factor exponentiated by their timestamp. So that in the case of a reward, the state values will be updated proportionally to their weight. Here the weights are indicated by the color. White is 1 and black means 0. So all the black states won't be updated. This mechanism has a computational advantage because it requires only to store a single trace vector instead of the last and features vector as in n step methods. Thus, the eligibility traces can be seen as an efficient implementation of the offline lambda returns with backward view. One of the natural effects of the eligibility traces is that just a single update allows the reward signal to propagate immediately to the old states that directly contributed to that reward. This propagates knowledge at a faster rate. For example, with temporal difference learning, the reward will propagate the value back by only one step. So the more distant the state from the reward is, the more iteration it has to wait before being accredited for its role. Updates that use the eligibility traces can give a great boost, especially in environments with sparse or delayed rewards. The conventional traces, also called accumulating traces, are based both on the heuristic of recency, just discussed, and the heuristic of frequency. That is, when visiting a state multiple times, the trace for that state will sum up, amplifying the update. In a few words, eligibility traces allow an online, incremental and sparse update by caching the last states visited. Now let's see the most common algorithm called TD Lambda that combines temporal difference learning with eligibility traces. The advantage of TD Lambda is twofold compared with offline Lambda return. First, it's online, in the sense that it provides a per step update without waiting till the end of the episode. Thus, we can use TD Lambda also in continuing problems. Second, it is incremental by distributing the operations in time. The eligibility trace is represented by a vector z with the same dimension of the weights of the value function approximator. So, in some sense, here the trace is considered for each component or weight of the approximator of the state value function. There isn't a trace corresponding to that state. The trace can be easily implemented as a lookup table with a separated value for each state. But this approach is intractable with high dimensional state space. So here we concentrate on the use of the function approximation. Initially, the trace is initialized to zero. And on the visitation of a new state, it is incremented by the value gradient that will fade away by a factor lambda times gamma, where gamma is the usual discount factor and lambda is the trace decay parameter. As we already pointed out, and you can see it from the formula, the trace stored in a fixed size vector, the decayed value gradient of, of all the states visited, so that when an enforcing event occurs, the usual TD error is computed and the weights of the state value function can be modified proportionally to the td error and the vector of the eligibility trace. This is the pseudocode of the algorithm. Pretty simple. As with lambda returns, by setting lambda equal to zero in td lambda, we get the usual temporal difference algorithm. Instead, by setting lambda equals to 1, we get the Monte Carlo return. 
but now we have a huge advancement compared to the usual implementation. In fact, TD1 can learn from incomplete episodes, modifying its behavior exactly when the event occurs. Cool, right? Here I presented a popular accumulated trace, but there exist many other types of traces like the replacing trace that uses only the recency heuristic or the Dutch trace. In the same way, TD Lambda is just the most popular algorithm that implements the eligibility traces. But from this one, many more have been developed. For control, the same principle of TD Lambda can apply to Q-learning called Q-Lambda, or in Sarsa has been developed Sarsa Lambda. You have just to update the trace vector with the action value gradient instead of the state value gradient. Eligibility traces have been shown empirically to lead to faster learning, but so far they are not much used in deep reinforcement learning. The problem arises from the compatibility of the eligibility trace with deep neural network. If you remember, the trace stored the value gradient, thus the trace is at neuron level, but because the gradient of deep neural networks are dense and it's summed up at each step, the resulting signal is noisy, and in many cases impractical, losing the benefits of the eligibility traces. One additional problem in the use of eligibility traces in modern deep reinforcement learning algorithms lies in the inconsistency with some of the modules used. For example, modern off-policy algorithms like DQN and DDPG use a replay buffer to store information that are later used to update the action value function. However, here two problems are countered. The first is that the eligibility traces requires a sequence of state action rewards to compute the update. A simple solution would be to store and retrieve sequences instead of single transitions. The second problem is that for its design, the target value should be optimal, not conditioned on a behavior policy. Instead, using a trace, the target values will be computed based on the decision of a old behavior policy. This problem has already been encountered with many off-policy reinforcement learning algorithms that implement n-step updates, as in the famous variant of DQN. But so far the solution has been to ignore it as long as the algorithms are shown to work well empirically. One of the few papers that implement the eligibility traces in an off-policy deep reinforcement learning algorithm is applying Q-Lambda learning in deep reinforcement learning to play Atari games. You can check the paper if you would like to learn more about it, but basically it ignores the violation of the Q-target and stores in the play buffer sequences of transitions. Also, you can check these two papers that aren't based on the eligibility traces, but on its forward view and have interesting ideas. Despite the failure of eligibility traces when applying deep reinforcement learning, they are a core mechanism of reinforcement learning with incredibly potentiality. They allow the update to affect states already encountered in step behind the reward signal. This propagates knowledge at a faster pace, especially in environments with sparse and or delayed rewards, accelerating learning, all with a very small overhead in computing the trace. Great, that's everything. I hope you liked the video. If you did, share it with your friends, colleagues and subscribe so that you don't miss the next video. I'm Andrea and this is Bits of Deep Learning. See you on the next video. Bye.